but we're getting there. Um, no, I think the situation is under control, but no, no, I don't think you should mention that at this time. I think it's far too soon in the process. We are extremely lucky now to have these medics on board with us, and um, I think we will succeed uh, in advancing this project as quickly as possible. I uh, am going to have to go now because they're giving me a minute in the middle of the conference to talk to them. And um, yes, I know I will tell them about this. This is not going to be easy. And I will tell them the other bad news as well. Thank you, Minister, for putting me in this position. I'm far down the chain of command, uh, but I'll do the best I can. I'll talk to you later. Thanks. Bye. Thank you so much. Uh, for giving me this chance to the conference organizers, for giving me the chance to talk to you uh, during the conference. Um, again, in the national interest, it stuns me that you, as a group of people who came here ironically to a seminar on health and health education, should now find yourselves in the middle of a health crisis. Um, as you know, there has been an outbreak of some virus that tends to mask a bit like the swine flu. However, we are not quite sure, for there are other symptoms. Um, also, the dreadful news I've come to tell you is that four people have died of this virus, and so it is urgent that we make progress. The Minister has asked me to thank you personally, has, has the HSE, for your cooperation, for suspending your own conference and now putting your expertise um, you know, at our disposal. Um, from this moment on, what we will do is to put a plan, an emergency plan in action. So if you'll excuse me for a moment, I need to look at my notebook because I'm not quite sure naturally yet who um, I'm going to get to know. Now, these people that I'm going to call out and put uh, in certain positions are going to have to meet me every six hours. Do you understand that? In the next 48 hours, you will have to meet me every six hours to discuss uh, our progress. Um, Dr. Patrick Hen, is he here somewhere? Dr. Penn, would you raise your hand so that I can see you? Dr. Hen, here you are. I understand that you have an expertise in detecting viruses, the nature of the virus, mapping the virus, um, how we can cope with such a virus. I would like you and your team, I presume you have at least five or six researchers, uh, your PhD students would be very useful here for this. Um, I want you to map and scope this virus and to tell us what kind of virus it is. Does it indeed relate to the swine flu virus? What are the other symptoms that are emerging? What can we do uh, to make the best of the situation in the short term, given that people are losing their lives out there and at the moment all we have is the swine flu vaccine? Dr. Deirdre Bennett, where, uh, where oh yes, Dr. Bennett, um, your expertise, I understand, is in these vaccines. I want you very quickly in the next 24 hours to figure, figure out for me what we can do here. Is the swine flu vaccine going to be adequate, given that we have boxes, crates and tons of it from the last episode? Or are we going to have to come up with a new one? However, we have several dilemmas, because how can we come up with a new vaccine and have no time for human trials or anything else, yet people's lives are at stake? There are also several people in emergency wards throughout the country, uh, and this virus is progressing. I also need to speak to Dr. Margaret O'Rourke, who is our psychologist. Now, where is she? Yes, Dr. O'Rourke, when it breaks, we have kept this quiet, by the way, from the media. They do not know as yet that four people have died. When this goes public, I want you to be there with a plan that will really help to quell the mass hysteria that might ensue. I'm hoping that you can come up with such a plan um, in this short time and that you have, again, plenty of your researchers with you that can help uh, to deal with this. You may also have to speak to the media. Uh, about this matter, but I am very concerned, you know, on behalf of the Minister, he's asked me to say that this is a key aspect, that we do not want to create hysteria throughout the country, um, that we want people to be able to cope, and so I'm hoping we'll have a plan in place and an advertising plan and so on. Um, Dr. Kelly, 
Martina Kelly, I think. Are you here? Yes. Dr. Kelly, you are going to be in charge of the emergency team. I want you to take at least 12 of your colleagues from the conference and to post them in different hospitals, particularly throughout the whole um, region, first of this, this area of Munster and Cork, where the outbreak has begun, but equally up the country. Is that understood? Um, and again, uh, you know, I can only give you about 24 hours to put this plan in place. And finally, Dr. Ashling Joy. Is she here somewhere? Um, yes. Now, it is lucky that your name is Joy because you are going to have to deal with the media. And this is going to be very difficult. We want you to be very careful. Tell them as little as possible initially. Be truthful but economic with it as is necessary until we have the situation under control. You will then speak again to them, of course, uh, more fulsomely. Um, again, I presume that you have a team of researchers who can help you to get this ready. Now, I'm going to have to ring the Minister and I'm going to have to go in a minute, but I am hoping uh, that we will be able to make progress in this matter. This is a national crisis and you are doing this in the national interest. Um, again, unfortunately, there was one other bad piece of news that I have for you. Um, you have come from all over the world to this conference here at University College Cork uh, on health issues and on the outbreak of diseases. And as I say, ironically, you've ended up in the middle of one. You will not be leaving this building. <laughs> We are now in quarantine. The Minister and the HSE have decided this. Um, I know I can, uh, your laughter is just a nervous reaction initially. This will be no fun, I can tell you, as the days pass and you will be here until we solve this problem. Apart from the 12, Dr. Kelly and yourself, you of course cannot return because, <laughs> you know, you break the quarantine. Now, I am going to leave you at that point and um, I will check in with you in six hours time. Uh, all of you, the team leaders, you will meet me in the cafeteria. Um, we will have no media statement at this time. Is that clear? But you, Dr. Joy, will do your job and prepare for me some way of handling the media. Now that is the end of our role play. And now I am going to discuss uh, the whole issue of role play assimilation and why I set it up as I did. Now, the most, I suppose, fascinating simulator of all is indeed the human being. The most complex, the most sophisticated simulator. Because after all, the human being has a power of imagination and creativity that can take him or her to any situation, any moment in time. And I think role play in that sense, and this is my big idea, is the ultimate pretense because it reaches the ultimate frontiers and boundaries, indeed breaks them, for the human has infinite capacity, can make a heaven of hell a hell of heaven, and can, in that sense, be forever flexible, forever standing on tiptoe, forever entering new situations, figuring out new perspectives, hypothesizing about what we might do next. So simulcare, the ultimate pretense, role play can take us there. Why is this the case? Firstly, of course, role play is as old as we are. We all play many roles. I play the role of wife, of mother, of sister, of lecturer, of friend, and so on. So every single day, we are used to playing a myriad of roles. Therefore, role play in that sense capitalizes on the human capacity uh, to communicate. If we look at it another way, role play in terms of semiotics, <coughs> that word coming from the Greek word semion, which means sign, in role play, we share all the signs of human communication. Facial expression, gesture, body language, movement, sound, voice, sound effect, and so on. So the role play, in fact, all we're doing is channeling our normal way of communicating and thinking through and hypothesizing and learning another way. So this leads me to the key point of today's session for me, which is that role play is another way of knowing. And we need many ways of knowing. 
I was fortunate enough to spend about 10 summers at the Harvard Graduate School of Education due to the wonderful multiple intelligences curriculum and assessment project that we had here in UCC. So I worked with Gardner at the summer school, um, the Project Zero classroom it was called, and one of the things we learned in those years was that people learn in different ways and they need different ways of communicating that learning. And so I'm putting it to you this evening that role play is a different way of knowing. In short too, it is a new way of researching. It is a process of inquiry. It is a way of learning, of opening up the situation that allows us to enter in and take multiple perspectives. Now, in terms of the role play that I began with, this is just very much the tip of the iceberg. I went into the role of teacher in role, having kind of created a scenario for you of me talking to the minister to create some sort of sense that there was something going on in terms of a crisis to do with a virus. Now, in the teacher and role, what's fascinating is that I keep my role as teacher in a sense because I take a parallel role, like being head of some team in the HSE, which again allows me to ask questions, to give directions, but ultimately uh, to facilitate learning. Now, I've called you all uh, by your name, some of you because, of course, I do know you in another context, and this is my chance to get back at you uh, <laughs> for all the trouble you gave me as students when we were doing the Certificate Diploma and Masters in Teaching and Learning in Higher Education. Um, but I have very deliberately done that because, let's say, if I have been sitting in this auditorium and standing here talking to a group of first-year medical students or a group of fifth med students. Now think of the fact that if I stand before them and I say, Dr. Murphy, um, I'm now going to give you the following role, and uh, Dr. Bennett, and so on. You know, unless we start treating them as doctors in every way, they won't grow into the role. So the idea is that in the teacher and role, I am facilitating the learning. Now there was a certain, you know, kind of acidic quality to my initial presentation, you know, as a civil servant who's stressed and out of her mind and who has been up maybe for 48 hours uh, thinking about this. Um, however, in class, that would evaporate. So initially what I was doing was getting, you know, the sage on the stage won't do. This, this we have learned that, you know, whereas the lecture is extremely useful for conveying information, all the research from Donald Bly and McKeechee and others tells us that the lecture does not work when you want students to make their own of the learning, when you want them to internalise it and do something with it. And this is where role play um, really comes into its own. If I go back to the Harvard Proje Project uh, Zero for a moment, there is a theory there about teaching for understanding, and uh, which I have found to be the most powerful in, in all my work. And it talks of a performance view of understanding. That is to say that in the doing is the understanding. But we're not only talking here of some hyperactivity, some dexterous doing. Rather, this is a doing of a whole engagement of the student. It is the doing uh, of learning. It is the student in the situation trying to find a way forward, owning that situation in his own space and time or her own space and time. So it is an active learning process that engages the whole person and that stands on tiptoe for one is never quite sure how things are going to work or where we are going to go. So we see the role play as a performance in that sense. There may be a showing in the performance as well, but it is usually more process work. The coming to know, gradually understanding over time, looking at the evidence and developing from there. The wonderful thing about role play as research is that it presents us with different perspectives <coughs> and therefore with possibilities. And drama ultimately as well is all about possibility. The great Stanislavski tells us that in the idea of what if, what if this happens and what if that happens. But of course this is not only about drama, for in life it is all about what if. What if we make this decision about the virus? What if Deirdre comes up with some other vaccine? What if life is full of thinking outside the box and the great things we have uh, invented are all about what if. 
So therefore, role play will also teach our students this thinking outside the box and give them several professional competencies that they would otherwise only come upon um, in the workplace. Now, this is a vital point as well, that in relation to role play, it is vicarious experience. That is to say, we are in a safe place. You know, this is not quite the real situation, but as Boal says, it is a rehearsal for reality. So we are trying to give the situation complexity. Now, I only began to do that in the role play, play by placing you in the different roles. Um, however, of course, were I to work with you in class, you might respond to me and point out the dilemmas. The TED Talk allows me to be centre stage, but doesn't allow you the same option today. It allows you to be spectator, but not spect actor. And if we were fully in the role play in, we'll say, the first med class, it would be possible possible for me to do that with you. Um, so what I am saying, however, is that you are given the opportunity in the different roles to be able to begin to see this disease from different perspectives. Um, so the idea is that I, as the teacher in role, facilitate the learning. I'm handing over to you as the experts. And the late, great Dorothy Heathcote, who died only a very short time ago, um, was very fond in her use of drama of placing the student always in the expert role. And my feeling here is that we should from the beginning treat our students as experts, not wait until the undergrad degree is gone. We have to gradually give them the mantle of the expert by handing over to them and giving them responsibility for their own learning, uh, where, you know, in, at an appropriate level, of course. So therefore, role play allows us those many perspectives and allows that vicarious experience to take place in the safe environment I talked of. Um, I think another important point to bear in mind about role play is the notion of it in terms of assessment for learning as well as of learning. If we go back to the Latin root of the word assessment, it comes from assidere, to sit beside the student. This is not to sit an exam for three hours necessarily. The sitting beside the student is about us partnering the learning here. It is about us, the teachers, the lecturers, as partners in this process as guiding the learning, but as open to dialogue with our students. So a sidere is all about opening up opportunity for the students. And I think role play is a marvelous way of doing that. We can learn how they are thinking and learning as we go along. And this is such a key way of finding out. It's also about ongoing assessment over time, rather than a terminal assessment fixed at the end. As you see, I am wearing the salmon of knowledge. Now, this is a key point on which I will finish my talk today. There is a wonderful moral to that legend that you'll remember. In the salmon of knowledge, Fionn was never meant to eat the salmon. The master simply meant that he would cook the salmon. And then, of course, the master was going to eat it and take all the glory. However, as you know, Fionn burnt his finger, touched the salmon, and he became the seer and the knower. Now, there is a wonderful lesson in that for us as lecturers. We cannot possess the knowledge. In short, the possessive view of understanding will not do. Where I stand as the expert on the stage, when I should be the guide on the side. So the master has to give away the knowledge. It is in giving it away gratuitously. It is in gifting the learning to the learner that I indeed can see the evidence of student learning. And my point this evening and my big idea is that role play can take us there. It gives the learning to the learner and says now, OK, you go and figure it out. You think it through. And I think as well in the light of the motto of this university, where Finbar taught, let Munster learn. There's a lovely balance there, that in the teaching is the learning, and it is through the learning that we find out if our teaching has been of any use. Thank you. <laughs>